uh, you have specific skills. So university is about developing the potential of young adults like you. But even if you look at universities, some things may change, right? And I'll talk a little bit about it uh, later. Now, other than just developing people, uh, and I think this is very consistent with uh, the views of ministries of education around the world, right? Uh, and education is actually a very effective means for social mobility. An educated person uh, certainly would have a higher chance to be more economically enabled and therefore be able to move out the social economic ladder. And I think that's what all countries hope to do. And if people are, are wealthier, people are happier, uh, there, there will be more social cohesion. And uh, this will be quite key all right, to a country. So a lot of government want to have this. I guess the difference is how uh, these visions are implemented. Now, if you look at uh, servant leadership, uh, these are some of the triads or attributes that you see in a servant leader. And a lot of it is actually very people-centered. Right? You talk about having the empathy right, towards people. You talk about building a high level of trust so that the people, whatever you do, uh, they trust that you are doing the right thing for them, for the community, right? And you also, in the process, have to be very encouraging and enabling, right? So sometimes it's not easy uh, to feed. You, you know, if, if you experience, you know, your parents were always traumatized about feeding you with medicine, which usually don't taste good when you're a small kid, all right? And, uh, but parents know that medicine is good because it helps you recover. I think likewise, you can draw an analogy that oftentimes governments are required to make certain hard decisions and uh, it is often challenging how to deliver these hard medicines that in the long run, the hope is to strengthen the society. So there are many of these attributes uh, that are actually very, very important. Another aspect is that any society has its diversity, has its different backgrounds, cultures, subcultures that uh, any government actually has to be mindful of. And, uh, to be able to integrate them and align towards a common purpose, right? That is non-trivial. Now, um, this is about servant leadership, all right, in the past. But uh, as in all forms of government, as in all forms of leadership, uh, you have to actually adapt to the environment. It's extremely critical that the same methods all right, that used to work in the past may not work now. And governments must be mindful that they must adapt and respond to the changes. So what I'd like to talk about today is about a change that is affecting us. Right. What you can see in the recent sort of uh, societal changes is that things move very fast, sometimes much faster than we could react. And this has sometimes very drastic circumstances. Right. And a lot of these changes has one thing common in, in them, is that technology becomes a key driver in pushing for some of these changes. 
something which uh, had happened in the past, all right, but it's actually happening much faster. So the picture you see here, all right, it's a human being, all right, and uh, as we progress, technology has advanced to such a stage that now with artificial intelligence, people are worried whether computers or AI would take over human beings, right? But I'm not going to talk about whether AI will take over humans, but I'm just going to talk about how we respond to some of these changes. So about pace of change, right? This just gives you an indication of what are some of the drivers or indications that the pace is very fast. Now, one thing, especially from the perspective of university educators like us, uh, we worry about are we universities all right, responding fast enough to the changes? Are we universities preparing all these young adults for a rapidly changing world? Now, one of the key things that you note at the bottom of this slide is that the half-life of knowledge all right, is getting increasingly shorter. How do I define the half-life? Right? Off the cuff is just that if you have a set of knowledge and skills, right, if half of it is, becomes obsolete all right, within a certain period of time, that period of time is called the half-life. It's a rough, rough estimate right, that uh, you could try to sort of put a number to it. And the half-life is now about 2.5 to 5 years. And in fact, it will become smaller and smaller. Another sort of uh, indication is that if you look at the economies, especially in the developed economies, all right, the jobs are being replaced. Right? As much as a third to 50% of the jobs in the advanced economies, UK, France, US, could be replaced by robotic processes, by AI. Right? And then what is going to happen to the people who are displaced? Sometimes government uh, would have less influence on business decisions if a businessman feels that by going on board onto automation, it can save business costs, they will do it. But in the process, if they displace their workers, then it becomes the government's problem. Right? So how do we as a society actually respond to that? Uh, interestingly, um, My view is that, yes, I think jobs will be displaced, but uh, I don't think it's that pessimistic. My sense is that more jobs will be created. So the challenge of societies and universities is how do we prepare the society for some of these jobs, the new jobs that are going to be created? Right. So more jobs will be created, but how do we better prepare people for the new jobs? Now this is a chart that shows you why things are very different now, especially with technology. And there you see three companies, IKEA, Scandinavian company, uh, Walmart, US company, and Alibaba or Taobao, uh, uh, a Chinese company. And here is just looking at business and how the three companies have actually grown uh, over time. IKEA has been a global company and I know that no matter where you are, you probably will be able to have access to IKEA stores. They are custom-made furniture which you can assemble yourself, uh, very classy, uh, very uh, functional and reasonably priced.
But if you look at its growth, it's actually, now if you stack against the growth of the other two companies like Walmart and uh, Taobao, uh, it, it, it dwarfs by comparison. But IKEA is a very strong company, my you. All right, it's just that we, we put with the chart in a certain way to accommodate uh, Taobao. If you look at Walmart, Walmart takes about 30 years to globalize. They became, uh, they start their globalization in 1991, and it took about 30 years to globalize. And they grew extremely well. Here you see almost 12,000 stores in 28 countries. On the other hand, Taobao did this in seven years. 2010 to 2017, uh, 9 million online merchants all right, across 222 companies. And if you ask what's the technology here, it's the internet. The internet provides the platform. All right, and the cashless transactions all right, is the technology that drives this. You are seeing many of this, all right? And we will see even many more of this coming. Uh, in Africa, that is a very nice story or parable, right, about a gazelle and a lion, right? So if you are in Africa, right, if you are a gazelle, you wake up in the morning, you better know that you have to outrun the fastest lion. Otherwise, you will be his lunch or dinner. If you are a lion, right, you also are very mindful that you have to outrun the slowest gazelle. Right? Because otherwise, you will be hungry. So it doesn't matter whether you are a gazelle or a lion. You wake up in the morning, you better start running. Now, in a way, I think this is a story about what's happening now. A lot of us always have to be on the move, right? Regardless of who you are. You may be a big boss, you may be a small employee. You just have to, all right, start worrying and start running. So the question is that, do you want to be a lion or to be a gazelle? I'll leave it to you. Now, um, what I've talked about is we are in a fast-changing world. And this fast-changing world, the World Economic Forum has given a term to this, the fourth industrial revolution. If you study history a little bit, uh, the first industrial revolution started with steam engines. All right, and that was able to drive uh, uh, Infrastructure that connects people across geographical locations. Trains come into picture, right? And uh, later on, you have electricity. All right? And electricity are able to power industries. All right? They are able to systematize the production of goods. Right? People can be brought together to train, to do certain standardized roles, all right, and through uh, electricity, they are able to mass produce. Right, and again, the mass production generates uh, huge uh, profits and wealth for nations who are able to capture that. The third industrial revol uh, revolution is about computers. It's about being able to use computers. And there you see that... Uh, that only happens about 50, 60 years ago. And there you see internet coming into the picture. Now we are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution where the digital, the biological and the physical rhymes are all merged together. Now, and you'll come to bear that in future you may not be able to tell what is a robot and what is human? Uh, that could be the eventual thing. All right. So we are in at the start 
of this fourth industrial revolution. And World Economic Forum, well, it is a platform where the thought leaders in the world, the governments, come together uh, to discuss about solutions to problems and solutions to grand challenges. And in fact, it outlined four principles on how we should respond to the fourth industrial revolution. One is we should focus on systems rather than just technologies. All right, because systems uh, gives a more holistic view and people are participants in the systems. So how people react all right, as in a systemic basis, I think that is very key. So always think about systems. Second and most important, and which is very aligned to universities, is that you empower our societies. The technology is there. Empower our societies to use technology, to learn the technology, to use it. But don't forget there's a challenge. All right? AI is a technology. To get yourself to be empowered by AI, it means actually a lot of preparations. The challenge is how do I get enough of our society to be up to that level where they can be enabled by the technology? Uh, that is often the challenge, but that is also a challenge that we think universities can do and can contribute towards. Uh, futures is us. So we should be designing our future. We should not allow technologies all right, to define our futures or a small group of people to define our futures. So I think it's imperative that we take charge and we try to design our futures. Now, um, there are some important attributes which I think the new servant leader in the fourth industrial revolution needs to be sensitive to, right? You need to have systematic and long-term thinking. And I think this is usually one of the shortcomings of governments, right? Most governments do not stay long-term. All right, governments worry quite a lot about elections, about whether they'll be winning their next round. And invariably, that does not allow them to think long term. Right? And that's always a challenge when you have governments who do not, all right, are not in a capacity to think long term. Inclusiveness, it goes without. I mean, we are all in a society, we have different backgrounds, we have different capabilities and abilities. We have to worry a lot about inclusiveness. So that's something which, uh, whether or not uh, you are in the fourth industrial revolution or in the past, you have to worry about. And because of this inclusiveness, it's very important to think of interdisciplinary uh, abilities. Right? Uh, one of the challenges of universities, and NUS included, is that we teach you always in your individual subjects. All right? I'll take, say, physics as an example, and in NUS. Physics is always taught by physics professors. Physics has a lot of implications and influence to other disciplines, even all right, in humanities. But very rarely do you actually get uh, that sort of interdisciplinary or outside discipline experience. Physics professors will only teach you about physics. Right? And um, it is very important that the new technologies, AI, data analytics, blockchain, you really have to teach our students in a very multidisciplinary way. And the most effective way, 
from our experience is that you bring in a multidisciplinary team, spanning experts from humanities all the way to engineering to teach subjects like AI, data analytics, and so on and so forth. So that interdisciplinary perspective is extremely key. Now, ex another thing is that in the world now, there's huge complexity. And um, complexity, uh, complex solutions, all right? You can never have a good answer or never try or aim to get a perfect solution. If you have 80% confidence, you should just go ahead. So you need to take risks. You need to move fast. And you need to uh, have that resilience to suffer failure, all right? to embrace failure. I'll come back to that. Then the last part all right, is that as a leader, you don't assume that you know everything. And uh, as you develop yourself, one of the key things is that you must have that mindset that you continue to learn. All right? And uh, you continue to learn, not just from people who are wiser than you. Uh, you continue to learn even from people who are younger than you. All right? Now, one interesting about universities and I'm proud to be in the university, is that you get different types of people, especially the young people. And you also get many ideas. And some of these ideas are extremely refreshing. Now, you're all young people. I can bet that you have many, many ideas, some of which I have not heard about. And I think these are the interesting things that society should try to capitalize on, all right? We shouldn't assume that people like me will give you all the good ideas. No, actually, anyone can contribute towards that ideas. And that is the inclusiveness. Inclusiveness, I think you have to be very mindful about equality and equity. So that picture tells you all, right? Uh, I was reading this recent book by Erin Mayer that even different cultures, all right, they have different behaviors on leadership. And especially if you are working in a team, you must be mindful of what works and what doesn't work. And one advice, especially that we give to students in multidisciplinary teams, is that you must be very conscious of the culture and of the perception of leadership across cultures. And usually in a team, it's often good to be more transparent. You talk about it. Oh, in Singapore, we do it this way. In uh, US, we do it this way. All right? And uh, if we are to work in a team, let's be transparent that, you know, Sometimes, you know, we have cultures that uh, may not be aligned, but uh, we, we know how to mediate amongst ourselves to make the whole team effective. Right? This is a very nice book about uh, leadership cultures. And uh, because we work more in multidisciplinary teams, I would advise that you, uh, if you have time, to read this book. So now, let me just quickly try to give you an example. Now, I don't have the whole day to tell you about leadership, and I can tell you many, many other things. But I'd just like to give you one example. You are a university student, right? Um, how can you use your time in the university, all right, to enhance one of the competencies? Uh, to enable you, all right, to be a servant leader. And this is what I'd like you to take back with. And I'll give you some examples. You are young, right? You are passionate with what are the things that you like to do, right? But sometimes, a lot of our cultures can be inhibiting. 
And a lot of cultures does not encourage us to take risks. Because a lot of our cultures does not tolerate failure. As an educator, yes, I think in Singapore, we focus a lot about success. But I think we have to think of using failures all right, to develop our students. So we think that embracing failure is important. Building that resilience is extremely important. And learning how to learn from failures will be quite key. And I'd like to give you a few examples. Thomas Edison, great inventor. All right. He invented the light bulb, all right, which you are still using today. And uh, a reporter was, uh, asked him a question that said that, well, uh, Thomas, you know, we heard that you, you uh, in your invention, you failed 10,000 times. You know, what sort of advice would you like to, to give us? And the way that Thomas Edison said was that, oh, I didn't fail 10,000 times. All right, I only found 10,000 ways that didn't work, but the 10,001 way worked. I mean, there you see the spirit, all right, of innovation is actually quite key and predicated on being able to embrace failure. Great things don't come just like that. Great things come because you have encountered many, many failures. But very often, you'll find that people do not sort of highlight the failures. Cultures tend to say that, well, failures are shameful. Don't talk about it. But I, I feel that it's important to talk about failures. Now, in Singapore, uh, we are a small country. Uh, I hope you have the chance to visit Singapore next time. Uh, Singapore and Malaysia, we are actually very closely related. Uh, and uh, we were part of Malaysia in the past. Sort of area from Kuala Lumpur to Shah Alam here uh, is more than 700 square kilometers. Right? So Singapore is very small. We have 500 5.5 million people. We have no resources. All right? We only depend on our people. And that's why Singapore puts a lot of attention on education. Now, uh, Singapore has been quite successful because of the way we position ourselves right? to be a very open, uh, industrialized nation. But we know that moving forward, we cannot keep on increasing the size of our labor, right? So we have to do things differently. And it is very important that we get our people to be more innovative, all right? To do things differently and to hopefully, all right, give us a new dimension, all right, in this very uh, challenging uh, uh, world situation. So NUS uh, in tandem, we started a program called the NUS Overseas Colleges. Well, the story started uh, in 2000s when we were looking at Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley in US, uh, in the early 2000s, they were quite vibrant and very interesting uh, ecosystem. Uh, a lot of the young people there, they are starting up companies and their, their big ideas are, I want to change the world. Right? I want to change the world, I do it. Right? Even if they, if they start with three or four people. You know, but that vision, you know, that dare, uh, it's admirable. So we thought that, can we bring in some of that uh, environment into Singapore? So what we do by business jargon was that we outsourced it. So we sent our students to Silicon Valley. Uh, we started it. In fact, that was the first time that we incorporate a one-year internship. 
We have internships in companies, but our internships are only six months. But here, we include a one-year internship. Right? And that one-year internship, we also make it very special. We put them as an intern in a startup company. And startup companies are usually small. Five to 20, 30 people. Uh, and we basically tell our students, you start understanding the roles of different people within that startup, from the janitor to the CEO. All right, so that you have actually a full appreciation on how it is, how difficult it is, or how exhilarating it is to run a startup. Now, uh, we have right now three locations in US, Silicon Valley, in New York City, in Toronto. We have four locations in Europe, uh, in Stockholm, Sweden, in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, in uh, Munich, Germany, and in Tel Aviv, Israel. We have three locations in China, in Shanghai, in Beijing, and in Shenzhen. Right? Shenzhen, as you may know, uh, is the startup city, or rather the equivalent, the Silicon Valley equivalent for China. And we send uh, about 300 over students every year for six months to a year in these places and in startups. And over the years, we have about 2,800 alumni. Uh, NUS is quite a big university. We have 38,000 students. So only about 3% of our students are selected for this program. Uh, and we don't select them based on whether they do well. Actually, we select them whether they have that fire in the belly, right? whether, whether they have that excitement, they want to do something to change the world. All right? And we send these uh, uh, students there. Uh, interestingly, uh, we have amongst these 280 alumni, 2,800 alumni, we have more than 650 startups coming from them. And this is an example of some of the startups. Uh, I want to pay attention on the startups that are uh, of interest, especially in today's topic, on how to serve the society. But fair to say that in NUS, we have actually a very good ecosystem that provides entrepreneurial support we bring in the people who can help the student startups, legal, administrative, and also the investors, right, to come and invest in their company, right? They also would have uh, access to NUS technologies as well as many events to help connect them to the startup ecosystem. Right, this is our global network. I would skip that. Uh, we have our networks or ecosystem builders in Indonesia, in US, as well as in China. Um, let me just quickly show some examples of social entrepreneurship startups, which I think are also very important in our ecosystem. Uh, and they actually directly do that with a view to help society, right? Take the example of Waterloo Room. This is a group of engineers who graduated from NUS Engineering. Uh, they made a pump, all right, that can convert fairly polluted water into drinkable water. That pump costs about 300 US dollars to make. That pump can actually supply enough water for a day for 25 people. All right, and it is very easy to use. Uh, uh, it, it is hand-operated. It can, if you have a machine, uh, uh, it can be converted into an uh, automated one. But hand-operated and extremely useful in a lot of the countries where they lack water, or rather, they don't have clean water. So well water, for instance, is, was, has been a common supply in many countries, but some well water can be polluted. And once they are polluted, it has dire consequences, which uh, would be much easier if we actually uh, 
control or have an intervention. So Water Room, group of engineers, very passionate about helping to stop the world uh, shortage in terms of uh, drinkable water. Uh, they are trying to market this. So far, they have impacted 70,000 people from 23 countries. And we are still working with uh, NGOs to try to scale this up. All right? So one thing I want you to capture is technology. Bagosphere, another of the startups, and this is based in Philippines. Startup in Singapore, based in Philippines, uh, and with the hope, actually, to enhance the society in the Philippines. Uh, here, what the company does is really about looking at youths, looking at youths that are displaced, but bringing them together and develop them so that they would have good skills to be able to find a job and contribute towards society. Right? So, they have, again, uh, they have just started recently, uh, they were able to convert a few thousand initially uh, and be able to place them in good jobs across uh, the city. Uh, there's another group of very uh, enterprising engineers from NUS Engineering. They are graduates. Uh, they look at Papua New Guinea. Right? Papua New Guinea uh, is a very poor country. Uh, and uh, they do not have good enough infrastructure, right? And if you notice the tagline of uh, Yona, right, it is uh, one drone at a time, right? And you want to revolutionize healthcare, all right, in uh, rural communities, but one drone at a time. What do they do? They actually get drones to deliver medical supplies to remote villages in Papua New Guinea. Uh, I was talking to them. Uh, they said that normally people would have to trek through the forest. And the trek to and fro can be about 8 to 10 hours. All right? And when you trek, you have to bring the supplies there and back. Whereas the drone can actually cover the distance in less than an hour. All right? To and fro. Right? So they conceptualize building drones to deliver medical supplies to uh, these uh, villages in Papua New Guinea. Again, technology is being used here. Uh, let me end with this example. Uh, I've asked uh, this lady, a female engineer who have graduated from NUS, to give a presentation to our Board of Trustees during one of our lunch. Uh, she's a very interesting character. Uh, she graduated in 2014, right, uh, in mechanical engineering. Uh, we have a program called the Design-Centric Curriculum, or program in engineering, where our purpose is that we feel that engineers should build things. So we should expose engineers on building things. It should not be just theory. You sit, in the, sit down in the lecture theatre and then just understand the theories. Engineers must build things. So she was pretty creative. She knew that there was a Robot X competition. This is a competition that is based in San Diego, US. And uh, it has been held for quite some time. And she was the first one to assemble a team when she was an undergraduate student. And uh, she named the project Bumblebee because she loves the show Transformer. So Bumblebee was one of her favorite Transformer. So she said, okay, you know, let's call this Bumblebee. And this is an underwater autonomous vehicle. Uh, can we play the video? Uh, right now, 
Bumble Bee is in San Diego competing. Uh, the results will be out tomorrow. And this is the video which they have prepared for the Bumble Bee, uh, for the Robot X competition in San Diego. Notice that a uh, torpedo was being fired from the uh, autonomous vehicle. This is automatic docking. It's a very multidisciplinary team uh, involving people from computer science and even some students from the business school. Thank you. Can I have the slides back? Uh, when you talk about underwater autonomous vehicles, uh, just a point. It looks simple on the video, but to shoot a torpedo and with certain degree of accuracy from an unmanned vehicle is a big technical challenge. All right? And uh, the group is the first group in the world who was able to do that. All right? Um, <clears throat> so Grace Chia, that's her name, and uh, that's that lady there, still very young, very uh, bubbly. Uh, lady, very passionate, wants to change the world. Uh, I, I took this slide from her with her permission because she said that there's a very big difference between passion and interest. And to her, passion means that you must be willing to suffer. All right? You must be willing to suffer to fail and to try again. Right. That's what she said. And uh, last year, uh, for the first time, our Bumblebee project emerged champions in San Diego. Right. And uh, out of the 40 over teams, our team was the only group that comprised of all undergraduate students. Uh, it was quite a big feat for us. In fact, technologically, they were also able to do what uh, many other people can't do, is that they were able to control a vessel which controls the underwater uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, which means that they were able to control two unmanned vehicles. All right, one underwater and one above water at the same time. All right, and uh, that's how they won the thing. And uh, she uh, used one of these slides to finish the, her talk, and I borrowed her slide. She's an engineer, and Bumblebee is the tagline for that group. And uh, I think this is very useful for my talk today because. What I want to tell you to do is that technology is a very important driver these days. All, right? All of you want to do good for the world. All right? uh, the world is very different. So, uh, other than being able to take risks, being able to embrace failure, you really have to incorporate also two other parts into your frame of things or frame of thoughts. One is how to enable yourself by using and leveraging on technology. And second is to inject business thinking components right, into your endeavor. Right? So in order to do good, in order to scale things up, you need to have business components. You also need to have technology components. That would actually give you a better winning formula. And I'd like to end by leaving you with uh, two quotes from 
uh, Chris Chia. Uh, sorry. Uh, 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 <clears throat> and 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 uh, this this is what uh, she said. Their mighty team, <laughs> engineer impossible dreams. And I hope you all can continue to dream, and I hope that you can realize your dreams. All right. Thank you very much. From Australia, but also from the Philippines. Uh, loved your talk. Uh, I've got many questions, but I'll leave it to one. I studied the Bachelor of Business, Creative Intelligence and Innovation, which focused on transdisciplinary innovation putting into that multidisciplinary perspectives and stuff, stuff like that. And I'm also doing the Bachelor's of Entrepreneurship Honours, which at UTS was a first. So um, you spoke about failure earlier. How do, you think that how, how do you think we can support social entrepreneurs in places who often don't ha have to innovate to survive and sometimes don't have access to those resources that you mentioned before, like, you know, um, uh, incubators, ways to pitch, like, Sometimes they innovate to survive, and in Australia that I saw is we can innovate and pretty much fail and start again. How do you think we can find those people out uh, in rural communities and you know, um, help support their ideas and give them a voice? Right. Do, you, do you want me to take question by question or you want to take a few questions and then I can try to answer them? Um, it's up to you. Maybe well, we can take a few questions okay, and then perfect. we can answer them. Thank so, you, excellent thank question. You. Cool. So Thanks. we'll take a question from this side now. Okay, hello, Professor Tan. Hello. Um, my name is Wu Bingxian. I'm a student in Wenzhou King University in China. Uh, I found you have mentioned many examples about business and technology, but my major is English and I plan to study comparative literature in the future. So my question is, how do these technologies affect me or students who want to work on literature or art or music in the future? Mm, very good question too, thank you. And to, about the uh, failure and re embracing the failure culture, in our, in our university, we promote entrepreneurship like the University of Singapore to teach students about failing early and learning more so you can start again. I was wondering if the University of Singapore has more specific Im um, examples on the university level to promote this risk accepting and um, trying again mm. culture. Okay, excellent question again. I can tell you a little bit about my plans afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I could see how taking on an attitude of uh, never ever giving up, if you did that, your pride could probably lead you to just stubbornly pressing on with a particular path when maybe it would, you'd be better served to try again but in a different way. So do you have any advice just in regards to knowing the difference between when you're giving up or re-strategizing? Good question. I, uh, a short answer is mentors. And I do have a question, uh, but before I do ask you that, I do have a small comment. Um, your servant leadership concept reminds me a lot of community policing concepts, uh, which is a concept where a lot of uh, cities in the US are trying to apply to their police departments uh, to be inclusive of the people um, as how effective as that might be. So the question is, in an era where um, AI facial recognition is an inevitability, uh, where privacy is starting to become more of a privilege rather than a right. How do you feel on how do you, what what are, what are your thoughts on the balance between long-term effectiveness of technology and also the inclusiveness of the people? Thank and you. if you do, um, if you do have any thoughts about it, um, what are the what are your thoughts on the, um, on the current uses of technology in fields like criminal justice? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent question again. Okay, maybe I can pause here and then uh, quickly sort of uh, respond to some of this. Uh, I don't have the answers to all of this. I think to Joel, I think about social entrepreneurship, that was very good. How do we support? Uh, we focus a lot on the ecosystem. All right, and one important part of the ecosystem is that how do you make sure that your team, all right, is enabled and your team has resources? No, a lot of us have ideas, but one of the important things is that ideas without resources is just wishful thinking. Mm. All right, so you must be able to find resources. 
Now, there are actually plenty of uh, people who are actually willing to provide help and support for uh, social entrepreneurs. But the, place, the key thing is that how do we get in touch with them and how do we connect with them. So, because of our ecosystem, we do have amongst a lot of the people who are willing to fund, uh, people who are willing particularly to fund social entrepreneurship. All right. And that's where I think uh, a, a, a bigger system, which has a bigger capture of the key players in the system, is very important. All right. If you do a lot of small things all spread out, you don't have that efficiency of size. Right? So you need to build a system which has a lot of efficiencies and then you can tap on, including social entrepreneurs. Now, Wu, Ms. Wu asked about uh, being a literature uh, uh, major, what do we do? Um, I, I would say that technology is a very important play and one important group of people that we need in how the university, uh, how, how the society interface with technologies are the people who study humanities. Very, very important, right? Technologies, you know, are not human, all right? The humanities people study how to be human. I think we need to be more human in how we engage with technologies. So, literature, yes, go ahead and study your passion, but my advice is that please do engage. Don't just shut yourself together totally in literature, but engage others and see how you can come together to help the society. Now, the Malaysian uh, educational system, I think, is one of the higher performing uh, educational systems in the world. All right? But like in all systems, I think there are uh, challenges. Right. Uh, I, th I think I c I'll be happy to talk to you on the sideline uh, and on, on what are some of the challenges and what are some of the things in which universities can. Now, universities are pretty big and you have some very good universities in uh, uh, Malaysia, the University of uh, Malaya, uh, which is actually our NUS uh, sister university. It's a, a very good university based in uh, 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 Kuala Lumpur. You have University of Kebangsaan, Malaysia, also one of the top universities, right? So I think universities, especially if they work together, can be very, very powerful uh, entities to push for change, right? Uh, Queensland, I, I guess your question is that how do we uh, promote uh, and, uh, social entrepreneurship? Uh, again, I think I want to uh, mention that uh, it's important to have an ecosystem that is rich and broad so that you can have access to the many other stakeholders and components of that ecosystem. Kurt asked a question about stubbornness versus resilience. All right, and again, we see it's human nature that I, I invented this idea. And die, die, you know, I must make sure that I st stick to this idea. Now, as part of our systems, uh, we have actually mentors. Mentors provide guidance to our student entrepreneurs in how they should re respond. And the mentors are also encouraging at the same time, uh, they want to be able to enable our students be able to Hell to say that. I think you have been trying quite hard, but maybe, you know, this is not the way to go. Drop the whole idea. Go on to the next idea. All right. So that is a very delicate thing, uh, which I think we get the mentors. And not just one mentor, usually a few mentors to help. Uh, now, in Minnesota, uh, the question from the student from Minnesota on community policing. Uh, Singapore, I think we do have community policing. We learn it from the Japanese. The Japanese has an excellent Koban system. All right? And the Koban system is really uh, the, the world-class community police because the police actually is a member of the community. And the police actually 
bring the community together and enable the community to provide safety uh, for the community. So for, for Singapore, uh, we learn the community policing from the uh, uh, Japanese. Now, in terms of AI and the applications of AI, I think this is a big worry. Right, this is a big worry because AI and many of the technologies intrude on our personal privacy. And privacy, personal privacy, is extremely key. Right? And how do we med mediate between that? Uh, this problem is not yet solved. Right? I think many countries have started by putting in legislation. Singapore, for example, in the World Economic Forum this year, we announced that we are putting, in, putting up, and in fact this has been approved by the government, an uh, AI governance framework. Right? And uh, this is done in consultation with many other countries and experts uh, because we actually foresee the dangers of AI, but we also know the power of AI. We want to harness the power and mitigate uh, the bad effects coming from AI. Work in progress, and I'm sure that you can contribute towards this particular aspect too. Okay. So I think I quickly uh, answer this. Come, we can have okay. the next. Uh, or the okay, we can take it from the left hand side over here. Uh, hello, Professor. I'm from the East China University of Science and Technology in Shanghai, and I'm quite interested in the NUS overseas program and some internship exchanging program to Silicon Valley you just mentioned before. So, and I have noticed that the National University of Singapore has selected students not only just focus on their grades and ranks at school, but also their passion and excitement for this program. So my question is, what kind of qualities should we acquire to strive for this opportunity, or how can we improve ourselves to stand out in this competence? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good question. Hi, Professor. Thank you for your speech. Um, I'm Hermia from Chinese University of Hong Kong. So um, my question is, um, in this um, fourth industrial revolution, um, we, have, we rely a lot on technology. But then yesterday, we also have a speech talking about um, living on $1 a day. Um, a lot of people do not have access to education, and not to mention, like, they don't even have access to electricity, so technology, they could not do that. Um, in this, um, the fourth industrial revolution, how could they survive? Um, would, um, of course, it's our re responsibility to empower them to um, um, share like more educational-wise, um, technological-wise, we should help these countries, but then would our pace with helping them um, catch up with the pace of changing? So mm. how could they survive um, in this era? And um, would this intensify the whole uh, world disparity? So basically my question is, um, how could these uh, uh, less fortunate people survive in this age? Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I nice mean, question. it's a very tough question. I don't think we have the answers. But anyway, I'll, I'll comment on it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, Professor. My name is Liu Fanhua, and I'm from Hefei University in China. And uh, what a coincidence, my question is quite similar to the former Chinese girls. Uh, she mentioned the uh, internships, and my question is, uh, we, our university also have the similar projects to send students to work in some uh, complaints to as inter interns. And uh, in the last year, I, am, I experienced this uh, interns in Metro for summer vacation. My, uh, but uh, in the reality, I think the knowledge we have learned in maybe these two years, and it's not, um, it's not uh, uh, how to say? Suitable. Yes, suitable or, the, or, or say didn't meet the complaints requirements very much. So my question is, how do we need to need to adapt to the uh, complaints requirements? And in our university, in our universities, what we should learn to perfect adapt to the complaints re requirements as an inter intern. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Professor. I'm Han Yumo from Wuhan University, China. Um, you have already given us a lot of directions on how to be a uh, servant uh, leader, but the, it, it is a little bit theoretical and vague. Uh, 
such as don't be afraid of failure, but I want to know some specific and practical and beneficial ha habits during your uh, undergraduate. Could you please share with us? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Hi, good morning, Prof Tan. I'm Justin from the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore as well. So um, I think my question is slightly similar to hers. I just wanted to get your take a bit more about servant leadership. So thank you for sharing about like interesting startups as well. But I think uh, many of us here, we, you know, we want to work to help others. Uh, and, but many, many times we are in the out groups. So for example, in Singapore, a lot of us are very interested in helping like the lower income needy families. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to find out more about how you link, how do you build tr trust and like have effective servant leadership when we're helping um, like people like the, the, who are like the needy? And also how do these startups that you just uh, mentioned, how do they actually embody the servant leadership theories that you just um, raised uh, in the earlier part of your presentation as well? Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, maybe I can quickly just uh, take some of these questions. Uh, uh, so we have actually a couple of uh, uh, questions uh, from East China uh, and uh, Hefei about uh, their university also having similar setups. Uh, uh, a lot of universities are actually starting to inject entrepreneurship programs, right? Uh, but uh, different universities are at different stages of their development. Uh, NUS, I think we are quite privileged in the sense that we started in 2002. So uh, that has been a good uh, 17 years. So we have actually learned a lot of mistakes along the way and we have refined them. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that uh, a lot of it is actually uh, uh, the ecosystem. All right? And related to that, you need to build an ecosystem to support the learning of your students. All right? And that ecosystem is very important. So even the ecosystem also embodies how we select people. All right? And we select people, not just professors select. Actually, we get those people who have actually done entrepreneurship to help us select. All right? So you have actually run a startup. I say, you come and help us select. Who are the ones that best fit the types of attributes that you have? All right, that is needed. All right, a, a, a lot of things you, you may know that we talk in theory, but impl in implementation, it can be very, very different. All right, so um, uh, I think that also involves in a sort of a, a, a one of the question. Now, the Hong Kong uh, student gave me, I think, one of the toughest questions, right? I think all of us want to help the world, all right? But yes, there are just many different groups of people that you want to help, all right? And where do we start? Right. Um, I, I guess we, uh, right now, I think what we lack is that we don't have a, a grand challenge of sorts, all right, where everyone is focused on. Uh, one example of a grand challenge of sort is uh, climate change. Right? Climate change, I think uh, every one of us is uh, 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 are familiar with what the effects of climate change, except for, uh, for perhaps the uh, US. <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, 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 we are actually motivated, a lot of us are motivated to try to do our small parts towards climate change. Um, so I think the, uh, you know, it's a tough problem. I, we don't have solutions, but uh, we think that uh, we have to move our way bit by bit, right? If we can help, help 10,000 people, let's help the 10,000 people first and worry about the millions that still need help, right? So, uh, being able to focus is one thing. Uh, likewise, if you look at our ecosystem, uh, we, we pay a lot of attention on how to make sure that whatever technologies or methods that you're employing, how can you optimize your efforts to help as many people as possible? Right? But like I've said, local optimization does not 
imply a global optimization. So that's actually a very challenging problem. Uh, I don't think the world has yet have the solution. Uh, on, on servant leaderships and examples, and, uh, 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 and uh, maybe my own personal uh, example, um, as a student, all right, uh, I think this, this is quite bad that uh, you, you always have rules and all these things. And especially in the Singapore system, uh, we pay a lot of attention on the rules, right? And uh, Singaporeans are very obedient. We conform to the rules. But I tend to like to look out for people who break rules. I mean, break rules in a constructive way, right? They, 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 they do certain things with good intentions, but not following the rules, right? I think this is what I want to try to encourage uh, all of you. So, as a student, I have actually broken quite a lot of rules. <laughs> uh, but uh, done in a constructive way, in the sense that without manners, uh, but with good intention to assume certain aims. And I think that is about innovative thinking, about more creative thinking. And I'd like to challenge all of you to try to do things differently, all right? Don't, don't be uh, compelled by your friends or your peers that, oh, we should do it this way, but uh, why can't I do it in a different way where nobody has done it before? So there are many paths where most people will encourage all of you to take, but there's nothing wrong if you choose a path that is less trodden, right? And perhaps that could be your path. But you have to have that mindset to prepare yourself that, yes, I can be different, I'll take a different path. But then you also must be mindful, like one of the earlier uh, students who have asked, know when to turn back, because if you are on a path that is uh, of... The, uh, that is not going to lead you anywhere, then you need to be sensitized that perhaps, you know, that's not the right path. I would have to rechart my trajectory. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. Over to you. Uh, hello, Professor. My name is Jackson. I'm from Changchun Christian University in Taiwan. And uh, my question will, will take place in both the technology you mentioned earlier and also the seventh leadership topic that you started with. Well, so according to the first committee of the United Nations, DICEC, which is uh, known as the Zimmerman and uh, International Security, they had the, the, there is this issue of uh, the laws, uh, the list of autonomous weapons, uh, which uh, you've clearly talked about the artificial intelligence area, so they are also part of it. Uh, so it's still an issue going on, and I would like to know your perceptions on how to, would you recommend either to ban them or just allow the countries to fall up and to build the, the weapons, the robot killers, which are, uh, these weapons, they, they are mainly going to kill people without the intention of the human being. Uh, uh, that's the description of them. Also, that's the first question. I have two questions. The other question is, um, how would you advise the United Nations to give part, especially for the least developing countries, um, to, to, to give the room for decision making, especially when it comes to big issues like climate change, you have said earlier. The big five countries have the power to decide what to do and what not, what not to do. Like, uh, like what the issue of COP23, which is uh, Trump did some, some, some so, uh, he, he denied Paris to say. Yep. Yep. So I would like to know how would you advise. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. thank you. I'd just like to remind everyone, one question per person. I'll take <laughs> it over to this one. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Adeng. I am a student at United States International University, Nairobi, Kenya. And my question is regarding the digital divide that is facing developing countries, such as the continent of Africa. And my yep. question is, what is it that you yourself personally would advise for us, because we are the future leader of the continent, and 
my university, we are 16, and all of us come from different countries within the African continent. And so my question is, what can we do to make sure that we're not left behind? Because right now, the divide is pretty big. And yep. the African continent is already left behind, and yet we're continuing to go further ahead. So what is it that you personally uh, advise, and what is it that your university is doing to make sure mm. that the African continent at least can catch up or even be closer to the finish line? Thank ah, you. Very good question and a very tough one, too. Uh, good morning. My name is Kathy. I'm here from Murdoch University in Australia. Um, I'm currently studying a Bachelor of Education. I'm personally very passionate about the fact that education is a great vehicle for change. Um, my question relates to, so in Australia we have quite a progressive education system. A lot of the qualities for leadership that you've explained are included in our curriculum, which I'm very proud of. However, I've noticed that I have children, being on the opposite side of that, some generation gap issues occur. Parents aren't as understanding of why these things are important and how they can be a vehicle to improve various aspects of our lives and their children's lives. Do you have any tips for how we can kind of bridge some of that divide? Thank, Thank you. you. Good question. Thank you very much. Hey, Professor Tom. I'm Pan Hello, Shishi. morning. Yeah. <laughs> Representing Ningbo University, China. And in your inspiring and uh, informative speech, you have mentioned the importance of technologies about how improved or even revolutionized our way of life. But not all groups of people in our society um, can have access to these benefits. For example, old people, they hesitate to adapt to new technologies and uh, disadvantaged people, the new technologies and uh, uh, like electronic gadgets are just uh, luxuries for them. So my question is very simple. Um, how can we allow all groups of our society can reap benefits from our technological breakthroughs? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank I think you. similar to the lady from Kenya about the digital divide and how to bridge it. Yes. Hello, Maybe my name is Justin. One. I'm from Western Sydney University in Australia. Uh, I work for a government organization that is very bureaucratic. And uh, your, one of your points up there about governments um, having very short-term thinking struck me very deeply. Uh, we, our, my organization is in a culture where uh, managers are viewed, particularly senior managers, are viewed quite favorably based on how much money they can save and not on any other leadership qualities or whether they make any improvements in the organization. Uh, how, how can I combat that as somebody who's quite junior in the organization? And how, how, can I, um, how can I ensure that that's not going to continue in the future because it's a culture that's only getting worse, particularly in the last 10 years. It's just getting more and more severe. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, a tough question. So let me uh, answer your question. All right. Uh, NUS is a very large organization. I have 40,000 students, 12,000 staff. So the whole community is 52,000. And I also feel that uh, NUS uh, can be quite bureaucratic. Because, you know, as, as uh, an organization that big grows in complexity, all right, there are just many people, all right, who would just want to justify their jobs and then will not have any sort of an inkling about uh, client or student centricity. And they would like to just make things difficult, right? So one, one of the things that I've been... Uh, uh, telling uh, my staff to do, and right now I'm actually pushing for a lot of changes uh, in NUS, especially in administration. Uh, I want them to challenge the status quo. Right? I want them to say that, you know, I have a set of rules, and uh, a lot, some of the rules actually could have been set by me right, many years ago. But I want my staff to say that, Please challenge the rules, right? And challenge the rules in a very smart way. So when I started the uh, uh, initiative, I actually gave two prizes to all staff in NUS. And uh, the first prize, uh, the prizes come from my own pocket. The first prize was that, can you tell me which is the silliest policy in NUS? The second price of $3,000, can you tell me which is the most unproductive policy in NUS that impacts the most people? 
by, by giving these two prizes, I basically am telling my staff that a lot of things that you take for granted all right, may not work currently, especially in this current world where there's a lot of changes. So you should actually think differently. You should be free to challenge the status quo. Right. And so it's a mindset thing. I want to change the culture, the admin culture. And I think likewise, in light of the rapid changing society, I think all organisations should be thinking about changing their culture so that they can be more adept. So that's a, a short answer. Uh, two, two students talk about the digital divide. Uh, universities can play a key role, right? Um, the way I see it is that in any society, let, let's take AI as an example, right? Uh, I think I see three levels. Uh, one is how to get people to be AI aware. This is the most basic level. Then the next stage, I have to get enough people to be AI enabled so that you can be empowered by using AI. The third level is uh, how to be AI ready in the sense that you can capitalize on AI to make AI work for you. Right? And you can think of it like basic, intermediate, and uh, uh, advanced. You need actually everyone to be at the basic level. And that, I think, is your first step. And that's the step where higher institutes and educational institutions can actually do. How to bring more of these people to that particular level. Uh, and you bring the gap closer between those who are not digitally able and those that are digitally able. Uh, in Singapore, for instance, uh, old folks are a big challenge, right? Uh, but the government actually creates a lot of computer classes for old folks. So I was walking in a park uh, yesterday, and I had a chance about two senior citizens. They were talking about apps, and, which is quite a good thing. Because to get a senior citizen talking about apps, that shows that, ah, they are trying to learn something. Uh, so, it, it's still a big challenge, but I think that certain organisations can uh, actually uh, contribute towards this. Um, the first question, uh, it's, it's tough. Uh, why? UN, I think, UN is an excellent platform. Right, to get many countries to come together towards a common purpose for the well-being of everyone on earth. Right? But different countries are always governed by their different governments. Right? And UN really have very little control other than being able to get the majority to exert pressure on the minority. Right? And often, uh, you know that it can be very challenging. You just need to have one role nation, one role personality, and it can upset a lot of the efforts by a good and well-intended UN. But if you ask, do we need the UN? Of course, we still need the UN. Because the UN is the only vehicle that we have. All right? Can we expect UN to solve all our problems? I don't think so. Because many problems, and even more to come, are going to be extremely com complex and uh, you, you really need everyone to come together in order to solve some of these problems. Uh, so I think the UN is doing a good job. I think the UN can be more empowered, all right, especially if you have, have more resources. And uh, we have to understand that the UN is limited by the way it is formed, but uh, uh, we also should not uh, have very, very high expectations that we want the UN to solve all problems. I don't think the UN can solve all problems. But I think humanity, if we work together, can solve all the problems. Maybe the last few questions? Yeah, we actually only have time for probably one more question on each side. I'm so sorry, guys, but please do ensure that you contribute next session. 
So we'll take one from each aisle. I'll start with this. Sure. Hi, Professor. Thanks for giving your time. Um, my name is Georgia. I'm also from Australia. And I also have a similar question to um, the last Australian guy who spoke to you about um, long term and strategic thinking. Um, in particular, in Australia, we have, at least in my opinion, somewhat a deficit of such forward and long term strategic thinking in our government bodies. And I think that Singapore, from an outsider's perspective at least, um, your government is particularly strong in its approach towards strategic and long-term thinking that goes beyond single-term bipartisan kind of policy. And so I was wondering, firstly, how do you think that um, our government leaders in Australia can learn from Singapore's approach? And secondly, how can our academic institutions facilitate this change? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Professor Tan. I'm from Tomasic Polytechnic in Singapore. Hi, good morning. Uh, yeah, morning. <laughs> uh, my question is actually a follow-up question from Ms. Wu's question earlier. I'm curious on how we can integrate the humanity and art subjects together with technology so that they can stay relevant and continue to grow together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. I'm so sorry to disappoint many of you all who have queued. Uh, but I think during the break, I'll be happy to answer sort of uh, more questions from you. Uh, so from the Georgia, from Australia, uh, I think the long-term strategic thinking uh, is uh, extremely important. Uh, I would say that Australia is actually very well placed. Right? Uh, Australia is, I think, one of the most developed countries. Uh, yes, I think you uh, may not have a, a very uh, sort of a, a, a long-term uh, government in a sense, but uh, I think the consensus between even different parties uh, are that there are challenges ahead and there's actually alignment in many of the long-term sort of uh, 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 challenges. And one, one thing which definitely the Australian government uh, has done well all right, over the years, is actually the focus on education. Australian education, from primary, secondary to uh, higher education, is very well respected. Uh, you see a lot of foreigners all right, from Asia going to Australia for their higher education. And that's because they are top of the class quality. Uh, you have a fantastic system of uh, universities and the government are working with the universities and uh, you can actually solve many of the problems. My sense is that uh, uh, your, your, your challenge is one of more geography. Right? At, least, at least one of the challenges is geography. You are big, all right? your population is actually very well spread out. And then, you know, uh, now it is made even broader because of the digital divide. So how do you actually now uh, are able to bridge the gap by making sure that uh, education uh, 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 reaches this group of people. Uh, the lady from uh, Tamase Polytechnic, thank you very much. Uh, it is a work in progress. And I alluded to it about why our higher education systems need to change. Right? Because we have been teaching subjects not in an integrative way. You look at your handphone. All right? Your handphone is an excellent example of a machine that is actually highly integrated. All right? You can actually use your handphone as a camera. Now there's no need for a camera. Every one of us uses our handphone to take pictures. And in fact, very good quality pictures. Right? The handphone all right, also does away with newspapers because we get our news, our information, all right, all through, the new, for, through your handphone. Uh, the handphone, of course, originally was a communications device, all right, but now it's more powerful because you can send videos, all right, you can uh, Skype, all right. In the past, when I was in the United States, uh, I have to wait once a month uh, to go and make a phone call all right, to my girlfriend, <laughs> all right, who is now wife in Singapore. Oh, and yeah. uh, one minute cost me one US dollars. And 
to a, a graduate student like me, I think it's extremely expensive. All right. Um, now, uh, I can just Skype and it's free, almost free. Right? So the handphone actually embodies a lot of functionalities and it is all about integrating. All right? But we never have been able to teach integration to our university kids. All right, sorry, I shouldn't call you kids, to our university students. Uh, we always teach them different disciplines and expect them to integrate on their own. All right, and I think that is flawed. That has to change. And that's why in NUS, we are trying to change that. I have uh, instructed, so uh, we have a quantitative reasoning course, which uh, is required by all students and is taught by a team of professors from arts and social sciences all the way to engineering. To teach them about numbers, quantitative reasoning is the, the prerequisite for data analytics because data is so important. I'm also preparing a course in AI to make sure that all my university graduates, even if you are a literature major, need to know something about AI. So that's the awareness part. But the AI course is not going to be taught by a computer science professor. Because if you get a mathematics professor to teach quantitative reasoning, or you get only a computer science professor to teach AI, then you get a very dry technical version. You need actually a team of professors from across the university to teach AI, to teach quantitative. So at NUS, we feel that the foundational levels uh, we need to have very multidisciplinary experts to teach multidisciplinary thinking and also integration. I think that's one way in which universities must change. Now, thank you very much. Uh, the, your, you have fantastic questions. I um, apologize that I don't have enough time to answer all of them, uh, but I'll be happy uh, to say, talk to you on the sidelines. But, uh, you are very fortunate to be able to be here, uh, thanks uh, to the UN uh, humanitarian, humanitarian Affairs, and I'm sure that you will enjoy uh, the programs that they have so painstakingly put together. Thank you once again.